So if anybody's got questions, we're going to start officially at seven. Um, I don't see any hands up. Hi, Steve. Hello. Thank okay, you. Hello. Oh, there we go. Greg's got his hand up. Go ahead, Greg. Turn your microphone on. Hi, Jan. I just, uh, it's actually more of a comment. You know, I, I did that. Uh, can you hear me all right? I, oh, yeah. I was oh, yeah. curious. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, uh, I had some questions about the uh, Chionanthus uh, propagation. Yes. Uh -huh. I had some seeds. And I I can't remember exactly how it went, but I, I, I prepped <laughs> the seeds in some some compost or some potting mix in oh i so they just sat for like 90 days last fall uh -huh. after i've harvested them and then i put them in the the crisper in the refrigerator for another 90 days i think uh -huh. and then i took them out i think i took them out uh somewhere late march okay. and i planted i planted them and uh they've I've just been kind of keeping it wet and uh, I waited for like, like from March, you know, when I planted them. And uh, just the other day, I thought, you know, this probably is not, I haven't seen anything. It's probably not going to happen. So I kind of bailed on the whole thing. And um, so I was going to take the potting mix and dump it back in my bag. I'm a cheapskate. So I was going to dump my potting mix back in that bag. So I'm out in the garage and I just thought, well, I'm just going to see what the seeds look like. And I kind of just dug around until I found, you know, a couple of seeds. There were roots. Yep, yep. There and are. I, I, I just knew this was going to be. I've done, I, it, I, I've done the same I, thing. I didn't. I only, I, I only looked at three of them. Two out of the three have roots on them. So I immediately watered them because I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I haven't watered them for about. I don't know, a week or 10 days and they were pretty dry, but I think, I think there was enough starch in the root to, you know, recover. And uh, so I water it all. I've got about, I think there's maybe 20, 20 seeds, you know, and they're in like three inch pots. That's you right. Know, the little, so I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited that, yeah, uh, I would, that I would actually be, my work. <laughs> there, yeah. there are a number of species. You know, it they, happens that that kind of thing happens so frequently where you've done something i don't know driving down the road janet and i a couple of times we said oh we've gone too far you know should we turn around and it's the same thing you give up on the seeds you give up on yeah. something and sure enough as soon as you say we went too far there's the road or you're going to go to do yeah. something with the seed and there's the plants i did that with yeah. uh, old I did that with golden rain trees uh, while I was in school uh, that we had to uh, get plant from seed and get them to grow. And uh -huh. so when I was about to give up, I got four of them. So. I, did yeah. that. I, uh, I did just what you did in dumping them with uh, hardy cyclamen. I wanted to grow those from seed and I waited the entire winter and the whole year. And in the fall, while I was cleaning up, I went, forget this. I had a flat full of seed that I've been watching and I dumped them. I, I tipped the thing over to use it as mulch and there they were all sprouted. A lot of species, <laughs> a lot of species have a two-stage germination. Oaks, for instance, they fall this year. The, the uh, uh, nut gets into the ground or squirrel buries it and the root comes out and it's not until the next year sometime that the top comes out. Um, right. So they're actually growing and absorbing water and a lot of them with the hard seed shells need to absorb water so that they they pop open the seed so uh, next spring you should have a lot of exciting things coming up and, and uh, yeah i don't know if i should maybe leave them outside or in the garage over winter or if i yeah. should just keep them in the house i don't know because i think maybe the overwintering they, i mean they may they may need the second cold period um yeah yeah some of my books tell that's kind of what i'm thinking yeah so so you got to put them someplace where you can keep them protected. Just not nestle them down low into a, a pit so that they're not up in the yeah. and put a blanket yeah. on the top of them and something to keep the animals <laughs> animals. Yeah, that's that's always a chance, especially the I've got a lot of squirrels here. But and the the propagation thing is I get I, I get a real kick out of that. I think so. we all do. Now, how many? Uh, yeah. Sean, 
show of hands in chat or what how many of you just love the idea that you can make another plant it's just fascinating <laughs> you can make another plant yeah if anybody else has a question we've got a few minutes here before we get going and i'm pretty sure that most of you go ahead gretchen i just got your email and uh <laughs> go ahead come on i just unmuted uh i raised my hand about the uh growing things because I love that myself but get something a house plant or something that you know just comes up but um, uh, I had uh did you get my pictures of the I the just did I was just walking around stretching and my I, I don't know what is that on that I, weeping cherry I can't tell yet what it is uh, and that's I was I was I, I sat down here after Steve signed up the meeting with my uh textbook and I, I said I was saying that um, I'm almost afraid to look it up because I look it up by the name of the plant and look through the things that that plant tends to have in, as a problem. I said I'm almost afraid to do this because cherry has so many problems. Um, the first one that I hit on though, as I went through looking, I went, you know, it could be a lace bug. Um, there are a number of insects that coat themselves with. Uh, with mm -hmm. wax and tendrils and whatever. And I, if you've got maybe an adelgid or a lace bug, but I'll have to look into it after we get done tonight. I, I wondered actually, I looked up a, a few things like it's, it does not appear to be black knot. No, it is not a disease. Be, because no. it doesn't have any a gall. It's kind of like, I kind of wondered if it was like little aphids or. Yeah, or, it's, it, it's almost certainly a sucking insect and it's leaving it, it Cause you know, it just comes off and uh sort of like and i did i do wonder if it gets an uh I, i'm thinking it doesn't get enough sunlight you know it's in a if i don't you're, know if you're still living on the property that i saw you on i i bet a lot of things don't get enough sunlight <laughs> yeah a lot of yeah, it, it's at my church actually Okay. Or it's at a church. And the reason I say that it doesn't it doesn't get much sunlight, I, I mean I found a beautiful piece of moss today to add to my collection from just <laughs> right around it. And I thought, you know, it's just kind of skinny looking and not that healthy. Um so and, and it, it could be, and it could be from a, a, a number of things. I've seen cherries in the in the shade doing fairly well. Um, but they they are fast growing plants that as a fast growing plant they can afford a lot more that's that's their defense against insects I'll grow faster than they can eat me um, so there are a lot of insects that they they support but I'll I'll take a look at that one and we'll feature the pictures next week so that people... and then the other question I have is that I'm thinking about uh, planting a big bunch of uh, winter aconite in my yard I planted some last year and right. I see. Yeah. I see that it's poisonous to animals. Is that a problem? I mean, it I don't really, have it really, I don't it really have pets. Be a it really shouldn't be a problem. Animals are very good at smelling the things that we miss. Um, okay. Yeah. If you have if you have a black lab that likes to taste things first and ask questions later, you, you might yeah. say stay away from these. But it's always good to plant a lot of winter aconite. You need lots of that. Yeah. Yeah. You do. Yellow bulb, and you want it to be all over the place. Yeah, okay. yeah. I th I thought a hundred. I got a, thinking of ordering a hundred bulbs oh, and two hundred or three hundred. Two hundred. Oh gosh! You're gonna I will. Plant, you're gonna plant three or four. You're gonna scrape away the soil and in mm -hmm. a space the size of your hand, and you're gonna put three in there. It's not gonna yeah. be too long. Enough. Right. That that would be better than the way I've done it in the past. I've I've done sec a section. They were beautiful. They're beautiful, aren't they? They are gorgeous. They're so bright and cheery. These are yellow flowers in the springtime. I wish we had a picture to show you. I Thank have. you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. If anybody's got any ideas for me on this one, um, uh oh, Cindy. Yeah, Cindy sent this. She said it's a friend's tomato. She said, and look, it's lush and it's beautiful and it has no flowers on it. Um, mm. I, I'm uh, I'm I'm not actually surprised. The temperatures have been being cold. Um, I know for certain that. If it goes below 75, you're unlikely to get pollination on a tomato. So cold nights tend to stop, if there are flowers, stop them from being pollinated. And it could very well be that it's just waiting for uh, a longer stretch of reliable warm weather. But it, it is healthy and it will bloom eventually. So I, I, it's one of the ones that I think, well, maybe somebody else has tried this before. She said it's a Roma tomato. It's definitely healthy. <laughs> 
yeah, look at that, that little, little guy grow. I do see something yellow inside that could be just an old leaf. No, uh, that looks a little right. bit like a flower, right? I right think, where your pointer is. Yeah, I think it's beginning to flower. I was circling there too, but they can't but see me. Your pointer isn't quite the same, yeah. <laughs> okay. What is this, Steve? Is this one of the hostas? Yep. That's gorgeous. And you got a uh, a little wasp or soft fly on it. Some some kind of insect. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our question will will end the uh, pre the warm up session here with our question, which is we're still hoping, and we'll just keep showing it to people until we find out if somebody has some idea what this might be. These white tendrils were spread all around through the maidenhair fern and the wild lily of the valley uh, in the Upper Peninsula. And Steve at first looked down and thought it was a dodder. Those are parasitic plants, but dodder has no chlorophyll. And you can see the green at the base of these. It looks a lot like it's something that has germinated and uh, moved itself around, but we're not sure what it is. Fortunately, it's not moving and it, does, it is green because I've seen white skinny things come out and move around and they are often uh, parasitic worms, parasitic on mammals. And uh, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't want to see those in your yard. Um, people burn those when they see that. Nice to see green then. <laughs> yes, yes, they're you know we love it. it it's uh, it's easy when it's green. Okay, I will get us started, Stephen. Unless you want to get us started, go ahead. Hey, it's free for all Friday, where we welcome all gardeners to celebrate growing and cultivate problem solving. This is our eleventh session of just inviting the world in to sit and talk about gardening, uh, or listen to other people talk about gardening. You can bring your questions. Uh, if you have pictures, you can send them on ahead, and some people have done that. Uh, meanwhile, Steve and I will tell you about what's going on in our garden. This is GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Janet. I'm Stephen. And, and it's Nicola. Stephen. Yeah. Or well, you said north. just Janet, so. Right. Or if you're up north, it's Nicola. Nicola. So it's Nicola voice. Uh, Steve takes most of the pictures. I do most of the poking my nose into things, but we both uh, switch off especially since we retired from actively gardening. We were, we gardened at our own yard and we gardened in friends, uh, fulfilling promises we've made over 40 years of gardening for other people that when we get time, we'll, we'll work on your garden. We've been doing that kind of thing, but we haven't been in other people's gardens now. And uh, so we do sit down together and kind of solve problems. Our daughter, Sonia Nicola, is with us when we do our webinars. And once in a while she pops up here. So if she does, and you see the name Sonia, um, or you hear hear her speaking. Uh, she is an accomplished gardener. She's also an English professor at a university, and that makes a big difference in helping us with Zoom problems. But today we're on our own. Uh, Steve and I are working on this on our own. Um, if you go to our website uh, and tell people they can go to our website, just click on the Fridays on the home page. It's on the home page if you're on a computer or, or iPad. It's in the menu, the main menu on the home page if you're on a phone. You click on Fridays, it'll take you to a uh, link and that link is always going to be there and you can just join us when you when you'd like to uh, on the website we have the things that we've written over the 30 years we've been writing and trying to share what we've been learning and it gets us by putting things out there to you it gets us responses back that tell us even more and give us lots of things to look into so we're always well open to questions there's our link on the free for all fridays page so what question? We'll start with your questions. Um, first of all, Diane has a suggestion for the non-flowering tomato. Uh, the tomato being fertilized with nitrogen may be too much prompting foliage rather than fruit. That's, uh, that, that is possible. Um, people are under the impression that fertilizers make plants flower, and they don't. Um, there are a lot of other things that, that, that make plants flower, including the length of the day, the temperature, the uh, position that it's in and how many hours of sun that it gets. But uh, you can fertilize it all you want, it won't flower. But there are times when if it's a really rich soil, it's gonna put a lot of, uh, of growth into, into leafy chlorophyll bearing stuff rather than flowers. So that can happen, but it's not um, it's not real likely in, in most of our gardens. Um, and I guess it would depend on what kind of fertilizer you're using too because some fertilizers are readily available and some are slow release. Here's that yeah. honey, honeysuckle, which Jim is on. Uh, well, I guess we can talk about this later. This is one of the vines that you can grow in a shady area for color. 
Um, Michelle has a wondering, have we heard of anything that would work as a repellent for Japanese beetle? They made lace work of her new basswood leaves. She knows she could pick them off, but she's heading away for a week. Um, I was going to say put put the pheromone traps in your neighbor's yard, all the way around your yard, all the way around your house. Yeah, yeah, but you got to have a big yard to get them far enough away. Yeah, I know. A quarter I... mile, they can fly pretty. They're not great flyers, but a quarter mile, they can follow someone else, another beetle's yep. pheromone trail. The only thing that we ever found to keep beetles off, the Japanese beetles off, was a floating roll cover that lightweight spun bond material that you can put over plants to keep them from getting uh, frosted in the spring also works to protect them from insects and the plant can still get water and, and light through it. Uh, so we would, before at uh, Margie's house, we would put a uh, row cover over her roses and raspberries because she just loved roses and raspberries, but so do Japanese beetles and she lived next to a golf course. The golf courses tend to produce a lot of Japanese beetles, not enough to kill their, their grass, but there's a bunch of them there. So we would put floating row cover over the whole row of raspberries and over each rose. And then you'd look out until you saw Japanese beetles crawling on them and go scrape off the first ones that, uh, that appear because the first ones are the ones that when they start eating, will start releasing pheromone that says there's food here and they're drawing in the others. So if you can just keep the first ones from getting to your plants, um, you, you may be able to, to get by. Uh, those little basswoods. Yeah, I have to check ours at the library because we have one of your little basswoods at the library. And when you want to see it get eaten up, it's growing quite well. Okay, yeah. what else have we got? Nothing else so far other than a thank you for the roll cover. She has them. <laughs> about, <laughs> she forgot about them. Okay, then we will um, proceed to some of the things that we've been seeing this week and that people have been asking. Like good root systems. Like good roots, you want to start with good root systems? No, I just, that one I couldn't help but say, yes, go ahead. We need to. Okay, we're going to, those of you who know us know that we have been stumping for well over 15 years to try to tell as many people as possible about the problems that are an, an epidemic when it comes to roots on woody plants that you're buying at nurseries. It's, it is not even a question of who you buy them from. They're all being produced this way, and there are very few people that are, um, able to get around the economic reality of how to sell a plant without ending up with too many roots running circles in the pots. Um, so we had, uh, we were catching up on email this week and one that we missed a while back from Terry Wolf. Thank you, Terry in Ohio. She said, look at what Joe Boggs, Joe Boggs is a treasure. He is, should be declared a national treasure, except we're a University of Michigan family. We can't say that about Ohio State, can we? But, uh, All we can in certain things. Yeah. Come on, give credit where credit is due. OSU is a great horticultural school. Incredible horticultural school. And they have a, a newsletter called the Buckeye Yard and Garden Online. And it is, uh, um, it, uh, you can just go there and search for topics. But if you want to go there, you're looking for Node 2347. It's, a, it's a, an article about mulch volcanoes. But if you proceed through the article, find that it is also about what mulch volcanoes do to plants just as if they are growing too deep in the pot, which is the problem with the roots. So you see that the primary root system needs to have oxygen. It needs to be where it is close up to the soil. But if you elevate the soil level, either as mulch or you put it too deep in the pot, which is what happens, the primary root system dies. Uh, I mean, it, it just, uh, and the, the roots above tend to wrap around. What I thought was also really wonderful is that Joe Boggs referred us over to University of Minnesota on a root study too. So we know that Minnesota and Ohio, I know that Florida, I know that Virginia. I know Colorado board. State did. Colorado and the Forestry Service, they're on board. So maybe this is going to get changed. But um, but I, I love Joe Boggs because look, he even, he even has the grim mulcher. He, he's humorous and he's real and practical and down to earth. Um, if you don't uh, take a look once in a while at the backyard uh, garden online from Ohio State, you should take a look. How's that, Steve? Does that work all right? Yeah, that was uh, great. <laughs> yeah, we're, I have to move something here. I've got too much stuff in the okay. way. I'm going to close my chat so I will not see what's going on. It's all up to Stephen to take care of that. Okay. Um, Gretchen is asking, is five gallons of water a day good for a Coosa dogwood? Unless you know the drainage of your soil, you 
I couldn't answer that question. I don't know her drainage. I don't know if it goes fast or not. And, you know, it, it makes a difference. What you, what you should do when you're learning to water a new plant or in a new place is you should water today and go out tomorrow and put your fingers into the soil to feel if it's cool a couple inches down. It, because uh, uh, an adequate amount of water and five gallons might be enough if it's a good size root ball and you've got a little levee built around it to retain the water, pour five gallons on, let it sink in, that's gonna wet at least four inches deep of soil. By the next day, if, two, if the top two inches are dry, then you can say, okay, I gotta check it again tomorrow. If by the next day, the top two inches still feel cool and moist, you can take a couple of days off. Um, but the plant's going to use more water if it's in more, more water if it's in more sun. It's gonna use more water if it's in more wind. Some species use more water and some root systems because of the way that they're spread out to when you first get started need more. So we always, we, we try to water on a, we call it our one to seven schedule. We'll plant something and water it the next day. Then we'll wait two days and check it. If it's okay, we'll wait three days and check it, four days and check it until we get them on a seven day schedule. And for the first year that a plant is in, we make sure that every week we check it and water it if it's dry. And, and that, uh, that seems to work for us. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I doubt. Um, some things that are happening this this week are things like, uh oh, number. Oh, you have to click on the number. number. We gotta click on the number. We gotta turn into a little hand. Um, July, which it isn't yet, except the plants think it is. Suddenly, there's a jungle. It happens every single year. People go, "Whoa, what happened?" I walked up to my son's garden. Went, "Whoa, what happened?" Um, because this is that time of year that that happens. While we were while we were driving home from the Upper Peninsula. The voodoo lily, thank you, Sonia. Uh, Sonia Sauter gave us a voodoo lily. Her dad has propagated them for a long time and she gave me his detailed instructions too. It had not showed, not showed, not showed for a month, well over a month. And while we were driving home, it jumped out of the ground 18 inches. It's a, it's a plant that has only one leaf. So this is one leaf that's unfolding. And, uh, and the leaf will spend the summer out and then it'll go dormant and then the flower will come later. The flower stinks. You really don't want the flower, but the, the, the voodoo lily, it's not really a lily. Um, it, it, uh, it's a very dramatic kind of, uh, I, I don't know, kind of a harlequin uh, outfit. And I'm thinking that that will look pretty neat out there. And that happens quickly. Two weeks ago, just two weeks ago, I was talking to a neighbor about her clematis which I had told her, you can cut it all the way down. It's a late blooming clematis. You're not going to lose a single bloom on it if you cut it all the way down because she wanted to put up a new um, structure for it to grow on. She, they'd found some neat sticks. So they said, I'm going to put these stick, paint these sticks purple and blue and, and put them up on the... Uh, so she put it up and two weeks ago it was there. She said, I don't think it's going to make it. I'm going to have to poke it up. I said, I don't think so. And in two weeks, look what it did. And it thinks it's July. Can you see the flower? It's already starting to flower. Now, this is one of the late blooming clematis. This one is, oh, I don't remember the name of it. Um, it's one of the uh, Violaceae. There's a bunch of different species of clematis. People don't seem to realize that. There are clematis that are bush clematis. Uh, we've got a couple of those growing in our yard. There are clematis that are kind of floppers. There are vine clematis, and there are clematis that bloom very early, mid-season, and late. This is one of the late ones, and it's going to have a lot of red-violet flowers. Look at all those buds. A it's lot. Not, yeah, <laughs> it's not the the late blooming ones tend to be not the great big showy ones that everybody wants to grow, but they they also tend to be resistant to the diseases that kill the big showy ones, which is really kind of nice. Yeah. And talking to the neighbor about vines reminded me that we talked last week to Jim. If Jim is here, uh, he asked what kind of vine he could grow and keep kind of under control on a, on a brick wall in the shade. He wanted to get some foliage up there and he tried two types of ivy and he ripped both of them off because he couldn't keep them under control. I forgot to and totally to put in euonymus. Euonymus, which is grown often as a ground cover. This is also called winter creeper and it's available in a whole bunch of different varieties of, of, of variegation. I like this one, so I kept it and I want it to be a ground cover. It, however, wants to grow on the house. Um, if you let it grow up, uh, how how high would you say it is at Dow Garden growing into the trees? Maybe maybe 15 feet? 15 to 20. Yep. 
and it holds itself. Maybe 20. I doubt it's that high. It's not like English ivy. English ivy could go all the way to the top. Yeah, this, um, like many vines, that ho it'll hold itself to the wall, which is uh, attractive if you've got brick. If it, it's growing upright and it rubs against the wall, the plant feels the pressure, feels the touch, and that stimulates it to grow those little hairy extensions that are kind of roots that help hold it to the wall. So you might want to try you on this, Jim. Uh, we had we had um, described to him harlequin honeysuckle. This is our this is our baby harlequin harlequin honeysuckle. It was not fair to show you pictures of most of the harlequin honeysuckles we planted because they're growing in the sun. Uh, the only one that I can think of that's growing in the shade is in a garden that we don't um, we don't know the people who bought the house, so I can't get back there to take a picture. But this one, we're poking it up. I noticed, Steve, that it's trying again to lean out to the side. Stay on the ground. Get back up in that arbor. Um, but it's not for the flowers. It does flower, but not prolifically, not in the shade, certainly. Um, but the foliage color is beautiful. Uh, it's a well-named plant, harlequin honeysuckle. And it is not invasive. <laughs> and did you take this picture just today, Stephen? Uh-huh. <laughs> Shoot. Um, I, I put the picture in because I noticed that this is something to tell people about Ioannis. If you want to grow the Ioannis that have the colorful leaves, whenever you see them turning to all green, see it there? You need to trace that branch back to where it sprouted and take it off, clip it off all the way down or even tear it off because that node has mutated or the mutation has, once a mutant, always a mutant. It was a, it's an all green plant oh, that the, produces these the other views were The views were just a little... Off when you started to say see that green, I was still seeing the the harlequin vine. Oh, okay. Well, this this green here is okay. the same, same plant, and it this is the species, and the species can produce these plants, these uh, branches, and that's what they propagate to give us these shrubs that are green and yellow, yellow and white, um, and green, all kinds of uh, this one that's a blue green color, but. Um, it's it's got a genetic instability and it can be unstable again. And if it turns all green, the green is going to win out because it has more chlorophyll. It'll grow over the top. Yeah, look, it's all the way up to the top of the image. Yeah, I actually uh, I actually gave up on this one. I kept clipping it off and said, you know what? I don't really care whether you're nope. green on this arbor. It doesn't matter. But I asked if you took this picture today because look at that pokeweed in there. Look at the size of that pokeweed. How did I Where did that come I from? We just dead. walked. We didn't see it when we walked through <laughs> three days ago. Little tiny weeds and the biggest weeds are the ones that get by all the time. Yeah, the poke yeah. weed that I'm talking about is right here growing between the, the, the spruce trunk and the um, uh, wood poppy. <laughs> Sorry. And this is a gentian septum feta. No, 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 not gent it gent gentian. Gentian starts with an L, Lago de Chigiana, I think. Lago de Chichina. <laughs> can't even say the name. Steve loves that blue, and it, it is a very good complement with the uh, Burgart and Sage. Yeah, that two types of the leaf there, the glossy and the the subtle. The, the, yeah, the soft and yeah, uh, more. Almost right. absorbs the light because of the crinkles. Yeah, I got flat and glossy going together. Um, well, if there are no questions. We have, a, we have a question from Elizabeth. Um, her deep red coleus is growing very slowly, and every plant dropped several lower leaves. Any thoughts? I know coleus doesn't like it cold. I wonder if these couple of nights that have been down in the 50s have been not conducive to them growing well. The 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 foliage, uh, not the the soil temperature, might have been colder than you think, even after those ninety degree days. Or did that hurt it too? Did it get overheated? I tend to not use coleus in the ground because they take a while to bulk up. Um, I put them in pots and then bring them out later. So I I can't answer that. Maybe someone has a has has a coax there. I'll, I'll ask around about that and we'll see. But okay. And we'll okay. Greg is asking, is a tendril type vine harmful to brick or mortar? It can be, yes. In any kind of plant can be harmful to brick or mortar. If the mortar is not sound to start with, then the plant will put um, tissue of one kind or another, stems, roots, hold fast into spaces. And those 
those parts will get larger and by hydraulic pressure, they can crack more to more. But a study done in Denmark, it's either Belgium or Denmark, Denmark, by the Forestry Service, and the Forestry Service in Denmark is in charge of a lot of their historical buildings, which include some of those castles that go back to the 1500s and 1400s. And they were looking at whether or not the walls were being harmed by the ivy growing on them. And they found that where the, where the, the wall was intact to start with, the ivy was probably preserving the wall. It was actually moderating the temperature and keeping it from swelling and cracking. Uh, but where the mortar was in bad shape, um, beyond the spread of the vine, the vine was getting into it and making it worse. So yes and no. Uh, if you want to put it on a wall that's that's sound, go for it. Margie, go ahead. Hi, um, this, this is for Steven, I think. Uh, what, you know, I'm echoing. It's okay, we're going up north and the black flies are out there. So is there a trick or something to keep to wear or spray or I I have them away. I I you know some people don't like the deep, but I will tell you the deep woods off works really well. Um there's also I've heard that they don't bite as well through polyester. I did not wear blue jeans. Uh I kept tight pants that tightened around my ankles and I always wore long sleeve shirts um, even on that one hot day because uh, they can get bad and if you go in the woods then it's the horse flies. Do you remember uh, yeah. do you remember when we were we were up at Copper uh, at the the golf course and Copper Oh Keywana Mountain Lodge the, Yeah and yeah, we were the, we were we were looking at the people working there. They had um, insect repellent on, but they also had hats with nets on them um, to keep them off their face. And we were kind of laughing, going, boy, they aren't even bad. And then the wind changed and the noceums moved in. Um, and then you'll find people on golf courses, workers on golf courses, walking around with their hand raised above their head because the noceums, anyway, tend to go to the highest point. So they're keeping the noceums up above their head while they get their hat on to keep their face yeah, I, I I didn't have a net on and I walked into a spot and I had 75 bites from my left ear to the Ooh. middle of the neck. Yeah. So yeah. Well, you really I, I don't mind using the deep personally because I've used it all my life and I'm gonna fade away eventually anyway. Um, but it it worked well for me. The other thing to do is earlier in our in our lives, Janet and I, I was her mosquito repellent. They came after me. Guaranteed. Now they go after her and leave me alone. Yeah, I had so my find somebody that attracts them more than you. <laughs> <laughs> How about like what color is there a certain no. color you should not wear? No, no. I I, I haven't I, heard I think, anything about colors. I I, I think no matter where you go, I wear olive green. I think no matter where you mm -hmm. go, you're going to hear netting. Uh, clothing that they can't get through, and indeed, it's just not getting around it. And the further you go north, the shorter the season is for insects, so the worse they are. I think we need to move on. Yep. Okay, thank you. We wanted to talk about prettier things today. Remember, Steve? Well, I, I had to protect myself. Okay, <laughs> bye. That's pretty. Protecting yourself is definitely pretty. It's true. Um, let's look oh. at... Uh, let's look at deadheading. Okay, because we... Um, I, I call it the uh, the white glove time, just being able to walk around flipping things and making things look beautiful and deadheading. Uh, this is the second time that I've deadheaded the Salvia uh, Nemorosa. This one is Salvia May Queen. No, not May Queen. Well, it might be East Friesland, might be May Queen, but they're, all the Salvia Nemorosas are wonderful. They're perennials. This one's new just in this year, and I've deadheaded it once already. This is the second time now that I'm going to deadhead it. And it's going to look like this. It's still got color. And now it's got lots of buds coming with more color. And it won't be making seed, which changes the hormonal balances in the in the plant, the chemical balances in the plant. And they, they uh, do tend to divert their energy to seed. So um, it's a spike type plant. So when there is more seed forming, then there are buds remaining to open. And I just do it by inches. You know, if there's two inches of seed forming and there's only a half an inch of bud flower coming, 
I'm going to clip that off. And if there's brown, I'm going to clip way down because there's growth coming from way down and the stronger the stem is from down low, the more, the more flowers it's going to bear. So um, that's what I took out of that plant. And some things aren't in, in our garden are meant not to be deadheaded. We're growing for the butterflies and the birds and the bees. And so for the birds and the, the bees and the butterflies, we need the flowers. For the birds, we need the seeds. This is cranbe meridimo or sea kale in our front swale. And nor I, I don't intend to deadhead this on a regular basis, but behind it, here it's in full bloom. Behind it, there are some plants that they come next in the bloom sequence, and I'd like to be able to see them. Those plants behind them that are currently covered would not normally be covered. Um, the cranberry went nuts this year in terms of the height of the stalks and the number of stalks compared to another year there that I just brought the picture in. Plus the plants behind are woody plants that are slower to establish. So as, a, as the gardener referee, you've got to look and say, I, I want you guys to live together for the long term, but while you're growing, I got to keep this fast growing guy from getting ahead of you. So I did deadhead those. I just clipped all of the flower so you can see the, sh the uh, shrubs behind them waiting to see their hypericum or St. John's wort. Um, and we know that the, the woolly thyme that's in this area, I've already started moving it out to the edge of the street after I killed the last of the grass out there. So I expect the cranberry is going to climb forward and uh, bully the thyme, but I don't want it to hide the hypericum behind. So um, I cut that out and it was not white glove pruning. It's, uh, it's a lot of crawling around on an angle to take that out of there. And it looks a little bit rough when you take all those flower stalks off. But here we are two weeks later and they're all fluffing back up and the bulbs that we planted between them called Trulia or Brodiaia, blooming blue, carrying the color through. Any questions or should we go on back to- Yeah, Janine, uh, the, their new property in Hillman has a creek running through it. Ground is really wet and not very mowable. Thinking about planting for birds need to be deer resistant and water loving. Deer resistant, water loving. We've never seen them eat the, the Myosotis scorpioides, which is not technically native, but it's been here since the Vikings brought it into Newfoundland and was already here when the Europeans got here. So there's some uh -oh. controversy. Um, certainly cardinal flower. I haven't seen them eat cardinal yeah. flower. Um, what else is it? Jack in the pulpits of all going to that. Primroses. Um, they will eat primroses, but primroses in a, in a moist edge of a, a stream grow so prolifically that uh, they can keep up with being eaten unless it's really heavy, um, heavy uh, browsing. Um, let me think about that one. Yeah, it's nice to have a new place to, to garden, isn't it? Exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. And uh, Karen is asking, is there any way to take the height down on a very old bird's, bird's nest spruce? Yes, there is. We don't have any pictures of that today because we normally do that pruning in either of the, uh, um, in, August. depending on how deep it is, how deep the green goes inside. We'll do it in August, late August, or we'll do it in early spring, late winter. Um, and we do have pictures of that. They're up in our pruning um, webinar and that, that pruning webinar, which is the first, it's like number seven, it's way early in season one, included pictures of cutting a bird's nest first that had gotten overgrown. But you can cut it back to any branch where there is still green needles on it. Um, if, there, if you have to cut it back far enough that you got a bare branch, then take that bare branch all the way back to wherever it came from and leave the ones with green needles out to the outside edge. Um, as we get into that season for doing that, we'll show the pictures again. Meanwhile, they are on the site. And uh, if you go to gardenaz.org and put in bird's nest spruce, uh, you'll find yeah. quite a few yeah. references to that. This this makes me realize how good Sonia really is because she would have had been looked at the website and had put the, already had put the link in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is a, it, well, we, we aren't fast. We, I used to be that, yeah, they're just going to have to accept us the way they we are. It's free for all today. Yeah. Um, perennials are not forever is a theme from this week. Driving along and, and going, oh. what, what's with what's with the daylilies? How come they're not blooming very well? 
These are repeat blooming day lilies. They're not Celadoro, but I think they're happy returns or one of those that, um, that were sold to landscape architects and commercial sites because, oh, they'll keep blooming. But get them three years old and, and butt it up against each other and they stop reblooming. They don't have enough new sections on them that bloom a little bit later. So you start seeing this stuff. And when I look at this and think about how long it takes to dig up, split up, replant a daylily so that it's got room to grow and bloom again, I think I am glad I don't work for a public uh, a parks department or a municipal department to have to do this. Look at how long would we be out there doing that? Uh, oh. and, and the last time that I did a lot of them, I, I remember at Shirley and, and Steve's, I did, um, oh, it might have been 12, 15 feet, uh, a border of, of, of re-blooming daylilies. And it took me most of the day. And I you only put in, put back into the ground a quarter of the daylily. So I ended up with this massive amount of pot stuff to compost, which of course at the time when daylilies cost more was something that Shirley didn't want to throw away. But yeah, that's not, that's not going to get better. And uh, no. they tend to get a lot of seed pods on them. Pick up any questions? No, let me double check. I haven't seen anything yet new. Unless I missed something, which I have done in the past. It's uh, it's still it's still possible to thin things out to make them healthier. And we showed you something earlier that we want to follow up on. We told you about tall flocks, which um, many people know is a is a real mildew magnet. This particular one is a good mildew resistant flox, but even it this close early in the year, this was uh, three weeks ago, early in the year. Um, air doesn't move through there and it just builds up the spores of the mildew. And when we get to this time of year, yep. We would have had it. Yeah, when you get to this time of year, when it's warm during the day and then the temperature goes way down, you get that big change in relative humidity and that's perfect for mildew spores to germinate and and uh, and and splash up on the branches. So I thinned it out. I could have dug it up in the spring and divided it. That would have probably been a better way to do it. But I just cut out branches that we didn't need. And here it is now. Can you see how lush it is? And there's still space down below on the lower parts for the air to get through and move those spores on rather than trapping them right in there. Yeah, very. Uh, we also very have another place where we did some thinning. This is an annual, this is a, a native annual that self sows on our property. In most people's gardens, I deal with it as a terrible weed. Uh, I'm a Jack's place, Steve. I was constantly oh yeah the landscape crew. Would you please pull this when you see it? Um, different but, strokes for different folks. Yeah, but the bees love it. They are especially late in the year. These little they're not extremely showy, but they're pretty color, and the bees are all over them. So we leave that. And uh, what's its name again? Sorry, it's called Dayflower. It's a it's Camelina annua. It's the camelina, C O M M E L I N A, will get you to it. It's a relative of uh, spiderwort or tradescantia. Um, it uh, earlier in the year, I thinned it out. It self seeds, and I've kept the area pretty well weeded. So it most of what's coming up is is it. But here on the driveway is where I've thrown all of the ones that I took out to give breathing room to our little trees that are in there and some perennials that I want to stay longer but I left the rest of them. I thinned out, I took it out where we didn't want it and left the rest of them because they act as a good ground cover. Uh, very few things grow through them. Yep. So now it's uh, it's 18 inches high, it's blooming, bees are liking it. Um, I probably should take out some of these horrid ravines that are here. We didn't- I'm seeing, a, I'm seeing a clock there now, it just changed. The, the screen has been changing a little slow for me. Okay. Um, I'm I'm looking at where I I see a clock right now. I've cleared them all out of this area, and that took me a couple hours, um, three about three weeks ago, to clear those out. I left the uh, the self sown Ori vervain. This is a native plant with purple flowers. It's another one that the pollinators love, and we did not plant it. It probably came on our shoes or our tools from our old house. I didn't think it was moist enough for it here, but it's decided it's going to put itself in there and I let it do that. Yep, you like that one. So you're using a self sown Pollinators annual. like it too. Yes, yes. Using a self sown annual as a ground cover. 
so we don't have to mulch that whole area. Some things do get through. Mostly this is a radium weed. Ooh, we just dislike radium weed. It's a euphorbia that belongs in Australia and I wish that it wasn't all around the world. Um, I must have missed that earlier in the year and I plucked it out now because I don't want more seeds of that thing in the ground. Um, and that reminded me, thinking about that it's related to Tradescantia, or this is spiderwort, our native um, Tradescantia virginiana. Um, someone asked what ground cover you can plant that will keep the weeds out. And my answer last week was that you, they don't keep the weeds out. They will keep seeds from getting hitting the ground if they're a nice thick ground cover. But weeds can get in underneath. Something I have noticed, and it would be great to go back to school and just be able to do some research on these things, is that quack grass does not grow into Tradescantia. I've dug up a number of areas where I'm cleaning plants out of, out of quack grass and the quack grass does not grow in. Other things do. This, this particular patch of, of uh, spiderwort has um, uh, buck, buck, annual buckwheat and uh, purple nightshade that come up in it, but the grasses don't grow into it. I don't know why. There are a lot of interactions between plants we don't know about. Um, so you might want to think about doing that. It's not a particularly attractive ground cover after it's done flowering because it does tend to go brown, but you can mow it and let it come back as nice green. Back to ours or what you got, Steve? Uh, no, in a minute. Uh, Karen says, if anyone's looking for a great shrub that deer do not eat and has beautiful blooms for a long time, her experience with the Calicanthus aphrodite is amazing. Yeah, they don't like that. Calicanthus are nice. Yeah, we've uh, we've we've shown you moving a calicanthus, and we've warned you about buying the calicanthus that are currently for sale, thinking that they are the six foot native. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are a cross with the eighteen to twenty foot Asian species, and they pretty quickly get up to 18 feet. So make sure that you have room for a calicanthus. They do bloom for a long time. And the leaves, the twigs, everything has a, a an odor to it. Um, I call it kind of like cinnamon. Some people say it's like strawberries or apples, but um, like many of the scented plants, all the mint family, for instance, and deer don't like to eat those. Yep, which is fine by us. Yep. Um, now, as well as deadheading, um, I've been called ruthless for a long time by a lot of people. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, because you don't know a plant until you've killed it. Until you actually cut something down and it didn't come back, um, and, and it has not happened very often. It just plants have a great will to live. I'm a little worried about what they think, but this, for instance, is Amsonia. Uh, and we've shown you this earlier. It's called Blue Star, and we showed it to you earlier to say that when it blooms, it's quite lovely, and in the fall, it's a beautiful fall color. And it's a big native plant that we want to uh, have taking up a good chunk of space over here. But I don't want a thousand seeds, seedlings coming up. I've got other plants that I'm refereeing and getting them to fill in. So while I'm waiting for the other plants to fill in so there won't be so many seeds, I am cutting it back. So I take it from blooming to cut back. And I just sheared it. I just clipped the tops right off of everything. Took it... Um, to get below the seed. It hasn't changed for me yet. Okay. I cut it um, about there a, it goes. I cut about a third of the plant off. I cut to get down as far as the flowers were because when it grows after it blooms, it grows up over and engulfs its own flowers. So the seed pods are being made inside the plant. I've had people tell me that they planted it, Amsonia, Blue Star, and it never bloomed. And I'll look inside the plant and there's seed pods in there. I said, it did bloom. You just probably weren't watching in the springtime when it bloomed. So I've cut those off and I'll leave them down as mulch. So they're shorter. For a little while, they're not going to show up as well. Hmm. And I've cut them down. Um, when you shear, you're cutting indiscriminately. I did not carefully cut at a node or out of side branch, I just sheared the top and cleared the top off to make sure that I didn't have any seed pods in there. And now here, this is two weeks later, they're back up, growing just fine, lots of new growth, quite happy. Um, there's where I cut it. Oh, it's probably waiting for the screen to change. There's a stub that I'm showing now and you'll catch up with you. The new growth has come from below there. We're not gonna see any 
sticky, pointy parts. Whoops, sorry. I do have to warn you about Amsonia though, and a number of other plants, balloon flower, daffodils, um, all of the milkweeds. They have a milky sap. Every place where I cut, it bubbled up with white pretty quickly. And most of those saps have a lot of alkaloids in them that can burn. And some of them, if you stay in the sun, burn even more. The next day, I was doing something here at the computer, probably checking email, and I kept thinking, what is irritating my arm? It feels like it's been burned. Um, it's not a great picture. I'm not good at selfies at all. Um, but that's the burn that happened where a bit of that sap got on my skin and I stayed outside in the sunlight. It's called phyto photo toxicity, phyto for plant, photo for sun. And there are a number of plants that will do this. So you want to, I try to garden with gloves on all the time, especially if I'm gardening with something that I haven't grown before. Um, and I always wear long pants because the backs of your legs are real sensitive to things. First time that I backed into rue, which is phyto photo toxic, I was, I was uh, unable to wear long pants for a week because my legs were so burned. Mm. And uh, cutting back is something that we, the, the you don't know the plant until you've killed it, is one of those things that you can learn if you just kind of sit back and look at your own garden. This is uh, an area where the idea was for the penstemon to be in bloom, and then the yarrow and the purple coneflower would take over, and as they waned, the, the swamp milkweed would start. However, nature has its own designs. The, the purple coneflower is supposed to be all along this path. And we, mm. and we, yeah. Have, yeah, we have one purple coneflower. We have three species of purple coneflower. They're not varieties, they're species. Um, uh, Echinacea purpurea, which is the common one. Echinacea palita, which is this one, the pet petals hang down. And Ech Echinacea paradoxa, and we're hoping that they'll cross and we'll get some neat things in there. But we have one flower. Looks like we've got a second one coming back down here, Steve. Yeah, there might be a few more on the ones that, that the groundhog has finally stopped eating them. Yep, but uh, this is what's going on in our garden. Uh, we leave the sunflowers that the, or many of the sunflowers that the birds uh, spread for us. We leave them up because the deer and the groundhogs really like them. You can see they ate, uh, and this was a groundhog, quite certainly, the way the end is cut and where it is. Uh, but didn't touch the butterfly bush, didn't touch the pine, just went for what they wanted to, to grow. People say, well, I could plant alliums around it and they'll stay away. Uh, they're very good at finding what it is that they want to eat. And <laughs> that. They, they, a bunch of alliums will not keep a groundhog from going through them to get to something he wants, I don't think. I, I don't think so either. But the point about the groundhog and the purple coneflowers is that last year when we said it was our first year that the groundhog really moved in on, on the purple coneflowers. By the end of July, the groundhog had lost interest in the purple coneflowers. Why? Plants, when they're browsed hard enough, plants will actually be triggered to create more of the, the, uh, the toxins that make themselves distasteful or even poisonous to, to animals. It literally, in a matter of days, a plant that's being heavily browsed can change its chemical constituents. So um, maybe the purple coneflower reacted that way and the groundhog didn't like the taste anymore, or maybe it didn't need echinacea at that time of year. But by the end yep. of July, we had a bunch of dwarf purple coneflowers um, growing and blooming at, oh, a foot tall. So- Rather than three. <laughs> um, and, uh, and cutting back hard is one of those things that I, I have lovage here. Lovage is a celery relative and it's a good eight feet tall. It's this upright plant, especially if it's in the sun. It's not in the full sun here. And by the time it's been blooming for a little while, it's trying to do what most plants do, which is trying to drop its seed further away from its own, its own base. So it, it, lends, it tends to lean on things. So I just, I'm cutting back on both sides of this plant. I'm cutting back what fell over, just as far down as I can cut it. Some of it is back underneath the shrub as mulch and some of it I've thrown out on the patio. But um, I need to have these later bloomers, like the obedient plant and the euphorbia that's good for winter. I need to protect these guys and let them keep going. So cut it back. Yeah. If it's in your way, cut it back. It's a plant and uh, people ask if that hurts them. I don't know if it hurts them, but any, anything that's evolved to feed other things must have, must be used to being eaten and have its own protection. 
Oops, went the wrong way. Okay, any questions? Uh, Ruth that wants to, going back to the wet area and deer resistant, there's also the Lindira, our native Lindiras, the spice bush. They definitely will like the moist area and the they will. deer don't eat them. Although if you like um, walking in the stream, they do make a thicket because they sucker and come up next to themselves. So you would you would not want to plant them all along your stream because they're they're big bushes and they get in your way of getting yeah. out. But they do fit the original quite criteria. True, true, very true. And then uh, Margie's asking, can I cut back the tall asters now? Will they still bloom only shorter? Yes, yes. Pinches you can pinch. At this time of year, there's no reason that you can't pinch your mums, your hibiscus, your joe pie, your balloon flower, um, sedum. Philopendula? Philopendula. Well, the, the late philopendula that we've got, the, the kind of unusual one, um, definitely you can, you can dead uh, pinch. But if it blooms later than the middle of July, if you just take some of the stems out, you'll have some stems coming up later. We do that with hibiscus all the time in order to extend yep. hibiscus its bloom. Um, same thing with, with uh, uh, balloon flower and with joe pie, we just cut them shorter. We've cut joe pie as short as about three feet tall because we wanted it to be five feet, not eight feet tall. So yes, you can do that. And okay. Yep. Oh, we have- Finch report, she said yes. What, what she said yes sorry i didn't but can you pinch it a foot and i said yes yeah the yeah tires. yeah you can uh, uh try to kill it just go ahead try it try to kill it try to cut it all the way down Rose. okay there now you're open i had um too much blue mist flower at a client's house and so i just mowed it all down and it bloomed oh three weeks later than the rest of it and it bloomed six inches tall people were asking me where i got the dwarf uh uh ageratum. Uh, we've been waiting a couple of weeks to show you, talk about design, because this time of year, you've got real plants you can move around. You don't necessarily have to dig them up and move them around, but you can actually take pieces of plants and put them in and say, how will that look there? Um, so it's much better than working on paper. And we have this area that we made a patio out in front of the house because it was silly to plant things where they were planted underneath here and in front of our, our lower level windows. So we made a sitting area and it's the garden that I, is my perennial garden. This is the only garden that I am allowed to actually divide things, fuss around with things, and treat it like a real perennial garden because it's about 150 square feet, and that's about what I figure I can keep up with. Well, it's the place where the lovage is, and yes, I still like the lovage, even though it does get to be a bully sometimes. Um, but there's a problem near the lovage. I've got a lot of nice plants there, and the space that hasn't taken what I've put in there. And that space is surrounded by a variegated obedient plant, a variegated euphorbia, and you can't quite see it out of the picture down on the bottom of the picture, this cute little burnet called the angel. So it's got these stunning plants around it, which make a triangle and make it even more apparent that there is a bare area in there and you want something. And I have been thinking and thinking about what to put in there. What can I go? I'm walking around looking at, at what, what I could put in there. I don't want it to be just green and leafy. It, it'll just blend in with everything else. While it's blooming, blue mist flower, um, blue mist spirea might be showy, but I'm not, I'm not looking for just the bloom time. I want them to look good together all the time that they're growing. So I don't want it to be just green. I'd love it to be a hosta. I'd love it to be something with big leaves and bright colors, but it's got middle of the day hot sun that most of the hostas are not going to be happy in, and I don't want to grow an unhappy plant. Same goes with the, the brunette semisifica or fairy candle. I love that plant, and the dark purple leaf would look good there. But this is a plant that needs a cool, more um, shadier area to grow well. And then Steve and I got to looking at our bear's britches and said, well, we could put bear's britches there. Bear's britches would look pretty cool. So you take a stalk of bear's britches, and you bring it over, and you stick it in the garden, or in this case, I photoshopped in the bear's britch. So yeah, while well, you know what, while it's blooming, it would look good, but then it's just going to be this green mound, and the yep. leaves are kind of the same kind of cut edges as the lovage behind it. When the lovage is done blooming, I cut it all the way back, and it grows back again, shorter. 
with no flowers. So, and Bear's Britches just keeps getting bigger. Um, this is my perennial garden that I'm talking about changing, but I don't want to have to be dividing something all the time. The Bear's Britches does get into a bigger and bigger and bigger clump. So Bear's Britches got thrown off the list. And then I remembered that we had a space like that at the Waterford Library where we, we garden with the other volunteer gardeners. That space is uh, surrounded by the arbor, the viburnum, and the gold uh, arbor vitae, and it tends to get attention. And I remember one year, we put a canna in there, a red leaf canna. And you shouldn't be thinking just about perennials, Janet, because you're just thinking about plants, what plant would look good. And I think that would be great. Now I just need to find a red leaf canna. And I need to remember not to, to, to read the label and buy a dwarf canna, <laughs> not a giant canna. It got a lot of attention, but it also crowded out other plants. So I'm going to look now for a dwarf red leaf canna for this year, or maybe a dwarf red leaf banana if I can find such a thing, because that, that would be the look to put there. And that's, that's what I think is fun about design. Cut it out, put it there, yes. Yes, something dark, something that as long as we got this triangle, keep your eye down on the ground in the dark. Thank you, Nancy and David, for um, sending in the picture of your garden. We helped them design a garden a few years ago, and they planted it on the top as the first year planted. And then this year, which is the second year, it's great to see things grow. I think gardeners not only like to propagate things, they like to see things grow. That's the uh, true dwarf go goat's beard. Dwarf. It stays about... Very dwarf. 10 inches tall. It's a runcus ophthusifolius. Coral yep. belts, probably uh, caramel candy, or one of those, more goat's beard. A Aurelia, which we warned them, you're probably going to eventually have to cut back. A, uh, um, a uh, lace cap hydrangea, is that what we end up putting there? And another coral bell. And on the other side of the courtyard, drawing the eye to their new Japanese maple, a path. You can't help but draw a line with a path. And lavender, big betony. Um, uh, dwarf butterfly bush, some Lysimachia golden coins. And then in this area right here, a uh, salvia, one of the salvia nemorosas I was talking about, and ladies mantle with a dwarf cat's mint, cat mint there. So Therese sent in a picture and she said, well, if you're looking at design thing, help me with this. I'd, I'd, I'd like to maybe redo this area. And she said, this is my problem. She sent the picture with the arrow. This is my problem. It's a lot of our problems. We, we share space with other people. And even if there are good friends, we don't really want to look at their cars all the time, do we? Well, I looked at that and said, okay, so you have um, tried to hide the car or truck, whatever happens to be parked there, by putting something there. And that's that's a good tactic to take. Let's, let's screen it off. But your screen is a bright, color and a, uh, a coarse pattern. So it's actually drawing attention there. It's become a focal point and you've emphasized it as a focal point by putting the, the planters in front of it. Um, I would start with change your focal point. Don't put your focal point where you don't want to look. Put your focal point where you want to look at some angle away from the, the thing that disturbs you. So I would do this, I would say, Move your, move your attention over to this corner. And I'll show you in a minute why I think that corner is good. And take a couple of these guys and move them out into the middle of the garden. The closer something is to you, the smaller it can be and still screen you from the far view. So between something at the arrow and something where you move some of your, your shrubs around, and we can move everything around. Gardeners do this. We did it at the, remember we moved an 18 foot tree at the, at the zoo. Um, and over in that corner where I'm saying draw attention, get a dark screen, something without a lot of pattern on it. Put in outdoor, outdoor room dividers into Google and images and just start looking at images. There are so many of them and you can even make them. I went and bought some uh, doors that were meant to be used for a louvered closet door and used them outside. We went to a flea market and bought old wooden doors and just uh, hinged mm -hmm. them together and used them as a but look, if you put a dark border, a dark barrier here, extending the wall, 
Now, it doesn't even have to be attached to the wall or at the same depth as the wall. It can be in your garden way, but it will visually take your eye across that area. Then you can worry about a shrub to put here in this area. And then you can worry about where am I going to put in the other places where I'm on these other paths and I'm looking, okay, then go to those other areas and say, now, what do I need to put there? That screen would help with this angle. And it'll also pull your attention off at an angle rather than straight in. And it, since you appear to like meandering paths, you're going to be able to do things a little less formally. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. I know your screen is probably going to change fast. I'm going back to a picture. Right now, you have a form. Our screen is not changing fast. OK, I'm looking to see there. There. Right, right now, when you look across at the neighbor's driveway, your attention is all in the middle. And it makes you put more things in the middle because the attention is there. The more that you put attention to the side, the more that you'll be able to do something asymmetrically on both sides of your focal point. So that's an idea. That's where I would start um, if I was out working with you in design, as I used to do for people. That's where I would start. What exactly goes in there? I don't know. You got to start somewhere. My dad used to tell me that. He'd say, just do something. <laughs> Because if you stand there for so long, you could have gotten everything done by now. Are there questions coming in, Steve? Uh, just Karen asked about if we thought about boom chocolata geranium. Uh, when it's booming, has a darker foliage. That sounds kind of neat, too. That's another it's about a three minute warning, and nothing else has come in so far. Okay. Michelle mentioned that the deer don't eat her bottle brush buckeye either. No, they, uh, their bottle brush buckeye have been uh, clean, steadily clean in the most botanical gardens for the whole yep. time we've been doing this. They, they just don't mess with that plant. This is the brodii that's blooming in with our uh, sea kale, the cranberry marinima. This is a bulb that blooms now, late June, and uh, I wanted it to show off in front of the big leaves. <laughs> um, we love it when you give us follow-up reports. We try to follow up for you on things that we tell you. Like um, I planted our tomato um, horizontally so that I could bury stem and get more roots on it. Woody plants, you don't do that, but you can do that with, with uh, a plant that grows readily from the roots. So I've taken off the leaves and buried it. And it very quickly stood itself upright. I stuck a stake there. I said, when you get big, I'm going to hold you to this stake. But... Three weeks later, it would appear that the groundhog really likes tomatoes, and I did not put a cage around it while we were gone up north. So I've got a few cherry tomatoes already, but I'm going to have to protect this to keep it going. Darn. And uh, let's see, who asked? I've forgotten who asked about the uh, the peonies that were dying back. I'm really sorry, I should keep names straighter. Uh, uh, tree peonies, and I suggested that maybe there had been some damage done by animals or winter ice and snow weight. Um, and same with her Solomon seal, pieces of it are dying back. She's written this week, it was Judy. Judy wrote this week, she said one of the branches definitely was cracked at the base. The other one, she didn't find anything wrong with it, but she trimmed it back and she'll wait for it to grow back. The Solomon seal she dug up and she did find, as, as we had suggested, that there were mushy places in the root um, on the rhizome, that iris-like rhizome growing in the ground. And chances are that something walked on it. I've seen um, the hooves of deer pierce things. And once you've damaged the bud, then it's open to fungus, especially in a mild winter like we've just had. So yeah, dig them up, get rid of all of the mushy parts, put it back in. A plant like Solomon seal will grow back in a minute, even if you don't want it. Um, Elizabeth asked about the pink mildew on the nine bark, and that's been fun to look at. Um, Nine barks, we've talked about this recently. Nine barks are very susceptible to mildew, especially the new varieties, which is a, just a, a crock that they're coming out with new varieties that are uh, very, very susceptible to mildew. But there's also, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot written about a, a mildew that's specific to nine barks. Many of the mildews that we get can host on a number of different species of plants. This one is specific to nine barks, and it does as it kills the plant. Uh, tissue, it causes new growth that's distorted and can come up pink. And uh, we 
told Elizabeth, it doesn't, it isn't born in the wood. So go ahead, cut it down. You don't even have to sterilize your pruners, cut it all the way down, let it grow back, but try to change whatever it is that's making that nine bark weaker and susceptible to this. See what's making the, the pink look because the seed, the flower, when it gets done, normally makes a pink seed pod. So there is that chemical in the plant. But what's happening here is the fungus is killing the, the old flower petals and getting into the stems too. And that's where the pink color is coming from. Julie has uh, asked about what to do with the deer rub on her amelanchia trunk, on her surface berry trunk. Um, this one doesn't look very bad to me. It's almost Not all, at all it's comparatively. Almost all, yep, it's almost all vertical. Um, and so just keeping the deer from doing it again should be a problem, should be uh, my, would be my goal. The horizontal strokes and the things that take out a horizontal section are more trouble. But if you can keep that, um, keep the deer away, in a couple of years, the tree can grow over that. If it's real fresh, if you know that it happened last night, you might want to get some grafting wax from a garden center and press grafting wax on to keep it moist there because that's what the bark does. It keeps the cambium moist so that it can stay alive. Um, I've even wrapped ace bandage around after I put the grafting wax on just to, to, see, to keep it in place. Um, but trees are pretty amazing for being able to put up with this stupid deer. Um, Sue wants to know if this is magnolia scale. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> magnolia scale is the biggest scale. It's a sucking insect that as it sucks sap, just like us making syrup, it has to suck a lot of sap to get enough nutrient and it passes a lot of what it sucks up. A lot of the liquid goes through the body and drips out onto the leaves below and, and fungus can grow on that. So you get... Same, same with on the bark, the bark on a magnolia should be gray. If it's a black bark magnolia, you've got scale. And it, the scale are on the wood. They're very, very dangerous in the long run to the plant. Yeah, not not immediate. You're not going to kill it immediately, but over over years, you get a standing population of them, and they do a lot of sucking. So each of these bumps is an individual insect that last August hatched out, crawled to the new the new wood, the new soft branches that haven't got bark yet, and started sucking on them. And as they grew they coated themselves with wax and attached themselves to where they're sucking. They're right. very difficult to kill because they're, they're, sh they're sheltered from pesticides that you'd apply to them. A systemic might kill them, um, but it would also make the whole plant toxic and we don't like to see people do that. Plus it doesn't necessarily kill them all. They're old, they're adults. But mm -hmm. unlike other scales, August is when the crawlers, the eggs that are being laid underneath these sealed down um, scales. The eggs being laid underneath there are going to emerge in a closed hatch in August and crawl out. Other scales, it tends to be the beginning of spring. So with, with magnolia scale, in August, that's when you would use an insecticide if you wanted to spray to kill the, the new crawlers that are crawling out and you'd be crawl spraying all of the new wood. If you yeah. want to keep them out and you don't have a heavy head infestation, then every August or late July, even starting late July, just go out with the hose and hose down the, the, the branches, the wood, the heavy branches, spray them with a forceful spray of water and any crawlers that are there get knocked off. It's one of those things that you could laugh at people going out and rinsing off their plants, but rinsing off works pretty well. So you said it was a three minute warning, probably five minutes ago. Well, we're after eight now, yeah. 8.03. So if there's not any, uh, we'll- uh, Mar Margie's asking about a peony that doesn't have any buds yet. Should she just take it out since they're in, not in full sun? <laughs> they don't have any buds by now. I, 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 if, if you've grown it for more than a couple of years and it's not blooming well for you, at least move it. Uh, we just told the neighbor to move one. It's probably in a frost pocket and the buds are getting killed. But don't be grumpy. It's July. It starts getting hot and sticky. Um, this fledgling robin was giving me the face and the eye as I walked by. Um, and it, it does tend to get hot and sticky. So be careful this time of year when you're out in the garden. I I cover myself up. If, if you go to use a horticultural oil on uh, magnolia scale, it can work. But it's when it's hot, it's not a good idea in August. There's no. 
and it's not be better alternatives. Yeah. So with that, um, if you have other questions, email them to us. You can text them to our phone number is there on the on the website. If, if we get them by Thursday, we can usually look into them for the um, Friday or Saturday session. Uh, but we, we try to answer everything. Sometimes we're a little late getting to them, but we try to answer everything. So we'll call it, that's it for Free For All Friday, number 11. We're done with number 11. Thank you all for being and I don't here. Know how to, I don't know how to spell Saturday, but next Saturday, we do have one of our- Ah, that's the way I smell it. Do you really? <laughs> so we do have our 165th weekend walkabout webinar. Uh, we have an event expert to talk with us because the topic is entertaining in the garden. And I don't think anybody in the local area and probably in a lot further than the local area has put more events together than Julia Hoffley. When I first met her, she was an event planner for the Hudson's stores. And uh, then she became uh, a professional gardener and that's where we got to know each other. Then she uh, started doing event planning for Golden Walsh Nursery. And some of you who've been there know what incredible programs oh, they had. And then she went to work for the Hardy Plant Society as a volunteer and has been putting the programs together. If you've been to any of those, you know that they're great. Plus, she guard, entertains in her own garden. If it hadn't been for COVID, she probably would have had 50 events in her garden just in the last five years. So we're going to have Julia telling us about how to make the most out of your garden. And that will be next Saturday, July 6th, not tomorrow, but a Saturday, a week away. And that means that our next Free For All Friday is the following Friday. Um, so Free For All Friday is July 12th, but we'll be here July 6th for those of you who subscribe to our webinars. And if you'd like to subscribe anytime, you can tell, send us an email, say, I'd like to subscribe. We'll put you on the list right away. We'll watch for your check later. You'll have access to 165 um, recordings already in the library, plus a personal invitation to each one as we put them together. It's fun. It is very much fun. All right. Okay. Thank you all, everybody. I am leaving. See you uh, uh, see you a week from Saturday. Bye now. <laughs>